Welcome everybody to this month's Tech Dive webinar series. And we, as I usually start out on this page, just to remind folks that um, we have all the previous talks here that have all been recorded. Um, if you're interested in watching some of our, of our previous talks. And actually we've had kind of a little run on Jupyter Hub here and there. And back in June, we, we heard how to install Jupyter Hub on the cloud. There's a demonstration of how to install that on the Google Cloud using Kubernetes Helm. And then um, in September, we had Brian Granger talking about Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Lab. And, um, and today we're gonna hear from Rob Bohenek about the research workspace that they've developed and it involves a component of a Jupyter Hub. And then next month, we're gonna hear about Jupyter Widgets. So <laughs> we're kind of on a, on a big Jupyter kick. Um, but, uh, and, and actually just as a reminder, if you wanna sign up for this mailing list and get informed about upcoming talks, if somebody just um, you know, CC'd you or something and said, hey, check this talk out, um, you can go here to the main interoperability and technology page and, and I'm, I'm the committee chair here. Um, and you can click this button here to join the email list, okay? So um, I'm going to now just switch it over though to Rob um, and let's see here. Uh, Mbari host two, and okay. We're, I, actually, I guess I should. Well, no, I'm. I'm going to let you uh, introduce yourself, Rob, and, and the project. Sure. Okay, hold on. I'm going to make you the presenter. So you should be able to share your screen. Looking good. Did you guys see this Google um, presentation? This research workspace. Yes. Yeah, so you're going to go to present mode. Yes. Okay. Um, real quick. Thank you guys. Oh. Hi guys. <laughs> I wanted to say hi. Do a face stream. It's uh it's cold and dark in Alaska already. So um, I hope you guys can vibe out some sunshine and warm weather to be. Um, but let me get off the webcam. Thanks, Rob. That's actually kind of nice to see yeah, who's talking. Yeah. Uh, you guys can see my presentation now? Yes, looking good. Great. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the research workspace. Uh, it's a technology that we've been developing over the last five years. Um, and recently in June, we launched the next generation version of the research workspace, which has a lot of new capabilities, specifically um, uh, Jupyter Notebook integration, and then uh, the integration with both data site for the mid of digital object identifiers and um, standing up a data one member node. So we're now uh, interfacing with the data one uh, network. So let's talk a little bit about some motivations um, behind uh, using the research workspace. So um, we at Axiom have been dealing with a lot of structured data types for a long time. So these are things like numerical models and sensors and GIS data, data sets. But um, about five years ago, we were asked by several uh, research programs to support their integrated ecosystem research uh, efforts. So these are basically scientists across um, the ecological domain, the geophysical domain, socioeconomic domain, all uh, working in their individual um, specialties, but then attempting to do cross domain synthesis and uh, being able to share data across groups and organizations that can be geographically distributed. Um, and you guys are very aware of, I'm sure, kind of some typical approaches to managing data for these integrated programs. Um, most notable is probably uh, the National Science Foundation's uh, long-term ecological research sites, the LTER networks. So you have those information managers who are tackling these same type of tasks. And basically, when we talk to the three user groups who were engaging on these integrated programs, uh, this is basically what we heard is that from the researchers is that they needed ways to securely share 
uh, data products and transfer data products between study teams. They were um, becoming very frustrated with emailing data between each other, uh, using FTP sites or Dropbox. Um, another issue was that they lacked tools to generate metadata and publish their data out to meet their data management requirements. Talking to a lot of researchers, they were saying, you know, we have all these mandates being handed down to us, but there's not really any decent mechanisms to execute these tasks. Like we, we're told that we have to generate ISO metadata or ecological metadata language, EML metadata, but um, the tools aren't, aren't apparent to us. Um, also, uh, a lot of these researchers um, complained about the inability to access high performance computing infrastructure, uh, that they were struggling with um, big data, big data sets and working with those big data sets. And um, there were some gripes about lack of reproducibility in terms of workflows. So when we talked to the data managers uh, who are supporting these programs, we talked to a lot of them and they, they, they were struggling because a lot of their data management protocols were developed in a vacuum, uh, vacuum kind of using their own methods, methods and systems. Uh, they felt that it was difficult to execute their job effectively, and it was not a very satisfying job being a data manager. Um, there was a lot of staff turnover. Uh, it was like pulling teeth trying to get data products out for researchers once they were done. Um, then we moved on to the program managers, the people who were actually funding the research, and they wanted more transparency to the entire research project. They, they they were stating that you know a lot of times we fund these research projects, we don't see any of the final results until year five when the project is done. Also, um, they wanted to retain the entire research legacy. So this isn't just the finalized data products. They wanted to retain control over like the level zero data and the calibration data and the field studies and the field, field reports and the standard operating procedures. Um, and they wanted to be able to track data publications through digital ob object identifiers and have just kind of like an understanding across their research enterprise, how many of the projects were minting DOIs, who's using those DOIs, and um, just for kind of like metrics of success. So the research workspace was designed to kind of address these three user groups and those use cases. And it's designed to help researchers organize themselves into projects which can then be organized into larger scale research campaigns and into actual research organizations. It enables people to coordinate data exchange across these networks, groups, and programs, allows these researchers and the data managers to generate uh, ISO 19115-2 metadata and 19110 metadata for uh, files, collections, projects, and data sets. Um, this new version of the research workspace, which was launched in June, allows um, users to execute server-side R and Python numerical workflows using Jupyter Notebooks on any data that's been uploaded to the research workspace by the individual researchers themselves, or they can actually access any of the data that we have curated in the Axiom cyber infrastructure stack. So basically any of the numerical models, observational time series, uh, GIS uh, data sets, satellite data sets, those are all av available um, as local file ac accessible data assets. And we've also developed an archive pathway to data one and uh, with the generation of a DOI from a, a data site. So the big three technologies that we've integrated, I would call these the big dogs, into the research workspace, um, of course, is the Jupyter platform for this reproducible scripting environment, uh, integrating data one, which uh, then uh, makes us a member of the data one network, um, and then data site out of uh, Europe, uh, which provides us with the ability to mint DOIs. So let's talk a little bit about the data lifecycle that uh, we're attempting to support through the research workspace. Basically, it starts with data creation and quality control. So this is either, you know, field studies, cruises, um, numerical syntheses, uh, laboratory analysis, those types of things. Once the data is produced, it needs to go into data storage. Um, then we need to generate data descriptions. So this is metadata describing the actual data products. Um, once data, the data description of the metadata is complete, we then go to archive and preservation. 
And so that means minting a DOI, creating these data packages, getting into national archives. Um, then once we've archived and preserved these data sets, we want to make them accessible. So we, we catalogs, visualization systems, uh, portals, those types of things. And then reuse and transformation, uh, that's when people take the data product and produce a secondary product or um, some type of novel in insight. Uh, and many times if they're producing a secondary product or fusing the data set with another data set, um, the cycle then begins all over again because they've produced another data set and then they then need to store that, describe that, archive that secondary data set, and then uh, kind of continue through the cycle. So uh, data creation and quality control, um, data storage via the research workspace, uploading it. We have the metadata editor integrated in there. Get data out to the data one member node. Um, data access and discovery through portals and CSW catalogs and such. And then uh, reuse, which is doing analysis on the data or generating new secondary data products. Here's a screenshot of the metadata editor. Uh, we'll be going into with a live demo to show that off a little bit more. Um, and then this is kind of the pathway that we're using right now to publish data out to data one and mid to DOI. And so uh, this is actually being handled by data managers as we have a data set review, we flag the, the package for archive, we reserve and mint a DOI, uh, update the metadata to include the DOI information, package the data set, push to the research workspace member node through the data one member node, and then uh, index and sync with the um, coordinating nodes of data one. Okay, great. Um, I think what I'm gonna do now is go into a straight demonstration of the research workspace. So the research workspace can be accessed from www.researchworkspace.com. Um, just I want to let everyone know that we are in limited release mode right now. So um, though you could come in and request to get an account, uh, we're not opening it up for public access until probably the February timeframe of 2018. Uh, the existing user base is really uh, vetting the platform. We're getting all of the bugs out and we're getting the onboarding process figured out. That being said, um, if you're interested in learning more about the research workspace, you could contact uh, Rich Signell or some other people who are actually users right now. They could add you to a new project and get you involved. I could do the same thing. But um, large scale onboarding is not gonna be possible until February. So let's log in. Logging in as myself. Um, so right now I'm looking at all the projects that I'm associated with. Here on the left side is a place where I can look at projects, campaigns, and organizations. And so a project, I think, makes a lot of sense to everybody on this call that this is a discrete scientific effort. Um, but a lot of times, multiple projects need to transfer data between themselves or they're involved in larger scale uh, group efforts that are trying to answer bigger ecosystem questions, longer term ecosystem questions. And so basically projects themselves then have to be organized into things called campaigns, research campaigns. And let's take a look at one of these campaigns. I'm gonna go to uh, the EVOS Gulf of Alaska um, Gulf Watch program. So this is a campaign that um, has been established by the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council to understand the long-term effects and ramifications of the 1989 oil spill. And so this is a campaign that is capturing all of the long-term monitoring uh, projects and data streams that are being collected, that were collected between 2012 and 2016. And so you can see here that um, in this campaign, there are about uh, 27 projects. 
we've got everything from uh, program coordination, uh, pelagic, like humpback whale predation on herring studies, uh, forage fish distribution, uh, near shore ecological trends, um, intertidal systems, harlequin ducks, you know, uh, environmental drivers, which is uh, physics out of the Seward line. Um, let's take a look at one of these projects. So this is environmental drivers, oceanographic monitor monitoring and cook inlet in Keshebek Bay. So this project uh, is composed of these researchers, Angela Doroff, Chris Holderine, several of these are NOAA employees, Martin Renner, he's a contract uh, numerical scientist. Um, they all have access and administrative rights. They're owner of this project. They've created this file structure to represent um, their kind of their data flow and the data that they're capturing. So here's where they've pushed all of their CTD data, for instance, and that's where you have your .com files for CTD processing, your unedited hex, uh, data that's been processed into CSVs, um, annual CT data files. And you notice here that this folder structure um, is green. So this is actually like a resource that's been published out. And uh, we can generate metadata for these individual resources. So if I go here to this metadata editor, this is metadata that describes that data package, that final collection of CTD files. So here's your resource overview, uh, contact information. This is the classic suite of core ISO 19115-2 metadata. Category and form, keywords, spatial and temporal extent, uh time periods resource content so this is actually the entity attribute information for all of um the ctd csv files that are finalized data products so here's kind of the the various um entities the columns that are in that data set and these are defined now there's several tools that enable uh, common data formats to be able to be parsed by this metadata editor. So if you upload a CSV file or an Excel file, uh, it will attempt to extract out those headers and then based upon its knowledge of previous scientists and how that they have classified headers, it may be able to auto magically pre-populate a lot of this entity attribute information. So for instance, if you if you had a, a CSV that had a column called SST, which stood for sea surface temperature, and you defined it once, the next time you came back to the system and uploaded a CSV with, S, a CS, with a SST as a header, the, the system would preemptively prompt you to say, is this, we think that this is SS, sea surface temperature, is it sea surface temperature? So we have some tools to kind of accelerate the way in which we can generate this metadata. So let's okay, go Rob. Yes. Uh, this is Ted. Um, are those, are those uh, I guess we call them vocabularies, are they just within a particular project? Or if another project already uh, defined SST, you know, or maybe three of them, does it, does it pick those up or? Oh yeah, it's collective. So it's like collective intelligence. So as we as we seed the system with information and like mapping SST to sea surface temperature or the climate for the CF convention, like the system actually begins to be better and better, get better and better at preemptively generating metadata. So exactly, like it's it's collective. So okay. and, and, and we're trying to figure out so, oh sorry. Yeah, it also supports sort of CF standard name-ish kind of things? Yes. Cool. And so um, you can see here that uh, we have files. Here's metadata. So this is metadata on the project level. We can generate meta metadata on a file level. We can generate metadata on a collection level. And we can generate metadata on a project level. Um, and this is a, this is a project level metadata file 
Of course, there's no resource content because we're just describing the project as a whole and we're not describing individual data granules or data packages out of this. Um, and here's where we have archives. So these, the, the researchers themselves, they isolated the final data products to a folder structure, designated that folder structure as publishable, generated the metadata, and that's when the data managers and the data coordinators come in to review the metadata, assist with minting of the DOI, and then this project itself has created these three data packages. And so if we go here, we'll actually launch the data one search, and we can see this project. So just to let you know of the volume of use of the research workspace right now, um, we have about 700 users. They've organized themselves into about 1,500 projects. So there's about 1,500 projects in the research workspace, um, about 19 research campaigns, and about 11 organizations. That constitutes in total about 30 terabytes of data. So researchers have uploaded, have dragged and dropped about 30 terabytes of data and almost 1.3 million files. So we have one point, people have actually put 1.3 million files into the research workspace as it stands now. Um, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit. And I wanna talk about uh, We've been talking up to this point really about kind of low level data management is uh, consolidation, uh, centralization of these files, um, getting supporting uh, transfer between study team members, um, generating metadata, uh, minting, minting DOIs, getting data to like data one and, all, and, and archive centers. But let's kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about using the research workspace to actually do numerical science. And so we have integrated uh, Jupyter into the research workspace. Um, and I'm going to be showing some examples of doing a variety of different uh, server-side scripting and executing these scripts. The other thing that we have introduced is um, high-performance computing uh, Dask distributed cluster, meaning um, if you need to do high compute work, numerical analyses like building climatologies from, a, from a large, big satellite data sets or numerical models or time series, um, instead of it taking weeks or hours, we can do these types of analyses in minutes now by parallelizing the work and using a, a Dask cluster. And I don't know if anybody on the call here is familiar with Dask. Um, I'm sure Philippe is and some other people, um, but that'll we'll show some of those examples. So let's go um, back to some projects here. So this is a little test project that we created called Summarizing Currents by Month. And this is a notebook that I just fired up. If you go back to the project here. So again, I'll launch this notebook. And the data set we're looking at right here is a ROMS, this is a vanilla ROMS model from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory describing uh, Prince William Sound. And you can access this model on uh, the AU data system. Um, so right now we're looking at solidity at surface and depth. We could be looking at temperature. 
And of course, you know, this model goes all the way back to 2011. So I could draw this, you know, say go back to the winter of 2007. This is sometime in January. And of course, if I roll over this, I get some various temperatures and I can go to different depths. So I can you know, drop down to my minus 200 meters. Looks like I'm dropping some tiles. Um, but say, you know, that, that model is actually describing currents uh, or temperature at hourly intervals. And say if I wanted to calculate some monthly needs. So this is a, a notebook that basically is accessing that numerical model as if it's a file and then running this uh, an average for January of 2016 and an average for July of 2016. So let's clear all these outputs and run all. So here, these cells are beginning to run. Here I'm doing uh, the analysis of the net CDF file. This is creating the January monthly mean. And then after that, I'll be calculating the July monthly mean. So this seems like it's taking a little bit of time, but in reality, if you were attempting to do this analysis using OpenDAP and connecting over the wide area network, this might take three hours or four hours. But because the actual compute is running on a cluster that is right next to this very large numerical modeling output, um, it's very, very fast. So we've done this in under a minute, per se. And we're gonna generate some plots down here as soon as it finishes doing the analysis. So, so Rob, what, what are the data, are you averaging just all of the data for one specific month in, in the year 2016, or are you averaging the data for all Januaries? Uh, this, one is, this one is just creating a monthly mean, but um, I'm gonna go to something that actually builds like uh, climatology. Um, I'll be showing that later. But yeah, this is just, this was a very simple example of showing how you could do server-side analysis on data that's in, that's in the Axiom stack per se. Um, so here, let's take a look. Uh, this is one model. This is um, the Rob's model, but uh, we also have every resource that we have on our cluster is available. And this is, in essence, a POSIX style path, like a file directory path to the storage cluster. So you're not interfacing with OpenDAP or threads, you're actually interfacing directly with the native files. And so everything that is in our infrastructure is available here. So this is you know, Aquarius wind speed. Um, you could go up here to PMEL and see here all these um, 100 year uh, NPZ climate models that are built upon, you know, these are huge resources. These are like 15 terabytes a piece. And they're describing seawater temperature, you know, phytoplankton concentration, large uh, copepods, all these types of data. But just realize that um, there's almost 300 terabytes of data that's available for analysis and doing it in a way in which it's pretty reproducible. So like here's the AVRH, AVHRR West Coast one month composite, daily composites, you know, Lots and lots and lots of data to be looking at. So let's look at another project. Um, you know, we looked at some numerical models, but let's go back, um, let's see my projects. This is a project um, 
where uh, we're looking at one of the things that people really struggle with is sharing and analyzing passive acoustic data. And so this is uh, basically a series of uh, audio files from an acoustic receiver over a two-day period. In general, a lot of these acoustic data sets go for years, and they're terabytes or 10 terabytes in size. And so one of the big problems is, is like making these types of data sets accessible uh, and in a useful way to researchers. And so here we've uploaded uh, about two days worth of acoustic uh, output files. And then we generated a script to build some spectrograms and audiograms and be able to um, analyze this data a little bit. So here, let me, let me load this notebook. And this notebook's pretty big because there's a lot of images in it. Should be loading any second. There it goes. I hope. Try this one more time. Refresh it. It looks like the kernel, what the kernel is light is on. Yeah. But it is kind of weird that nothing is showing up. Yeah, and it there's like fifty oh, there's like fifty megabytes of content. That's the problem. So here's a bunch of these spectrograms. Of course, this this notebook has all already been run. But we can rerun this. Um, so let's say let's clear all the output. Okay, so all that output's clear now. And then let's rerun all. So plot the wave file. And here it's going to start making these spectrograms. Regenerating these. So I, I'm not a acoustic acoustician, but um, some of the data scientists here said, look at some of these, these spectrograms that have kind of a lot of things going on, for instance, like this one. Uh, we can play this. Do you guys hear that? Do you, do you guys hear that? Uh, not really. OK, I'm going to hold on. I'll play it, and then I'll put the speaker to the microphone. Oh, yeah, we hear that. <laughs> yep, it's a, it's a whale party. So it seems, looking at the spectrograms, it looks like between 11 p.m. and about 1 a.m., these whales are getting really crazy and making lots of really weird noise. So, um, anyways, we, we, this, this is a human way to read these spectrograms and to look at them. But of course, like you could do some image analysis to start looking for species vocalizations, processing those types of things. Um, would be really, really useful ways to kind of deal with that type of data. Is that how you store you store the data as as wave files as opposed to you know some other multi-dimensional format or well that's that's what we got from the researcher. So this was Kate oh. Stafford out of University of Washington. Um, this was her her uh, Rusalka, which is a Russian American Beaufort C study. So this is her data, and she she works in dot wave files. But I've seen other passive acoustic data data types. Right. Okay, one more example. Hey, 
Let's go to uh, the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And so this um, Franz Muter came in here and he uploaded a variety of fish haul data from his fisheries. So this is uh, his hauls and his specimens output. And then he completely by himself generated some of these uh, Jupyter notebooks using the R kernel. And here he's actually generated his species accumulation curves. So this is where he wrote his R code, started generating some of these number of species based on samples. You see it's beginning to approach this asymptote. So this is doing some biodiversity um, kind of ecosystem level uh, calculations based on the data he uploaded. And of course, what's awesome about this is that simply all he needs to do is then share this project with another user, um, make them have read-only access so they can't modify it, but they can simply come in here and look at how he wrote his script, tweak it, uh, clone the script, or possibly even rerun it themselves. So um, I guess the next example I'd like to show uh, is um, accessing some high-performance computing resources. And then I'd like to kind of open up for some questions. And anyways, uh, before I go to the high-performance computing example, are there any immediate questions right now? Uh, well, I have a few questions. Um, I don't know if I should ask them now or, or later. When One thing I'll ask in the, um, you mentioned when you mint a DOI that you edit the metadata, uh, I assume by machine to, to add that uh, DOI in. Uh, is there a mechanism for capturing uh, lineage or processing metadata from uh, processing that goes on within the, uh, within the research, uh, within the system? Yes, so um, there is, I mean, there's, in, if you go to any of these projects, uh, let's see, go back. Um, there is, you know, Cubid, here you have like your uh, methods and your process steps, you know, but these are, these are describing like what the Cubid did. Um, but we also contain, uh, we're beginning to capture like a uh, provenance, RDF information, it, I mean, storing it in RDF basically is like every time a user comes to the research workspace and does something, whether they access a file, produce a secondary file, uh, mint the DOI, uh, all these types of things, those all get entered in into this pro provenance graph. And so we can actually track, you know, uh, on a machine level, what types of processes are taking place and what users are doing and what data that they're, they're, they're using to do that. Um, I assume you're using Prov for that. We're using our own homegrown schema right now, but we're going to look to use Prov. That that's much much more sophisticated than what we're currently capturing with our subjects and predicates and verbs and all that stuff. But um, yes, that's where we're going to be moving towards. And it's clear that there's a mapping between our homegrown Prov uh, ontology and the real Prov. So we're gonna we're moving towards that. Um, yes. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, it's basically uh, can you customize your how do you customize your environment if you want to run a different you know kind of environment? Right. Uh, so let's look at this. Um, So the way in which you customize your your kernel right now is by adding in the like there's these and I'm not really I'm not a Python person so uh, right now it's kind of wonky the way in which you customize your kernel basically you have to install the additional conda packages at the startup um, 
but what we're working on is the ability to uh, customize your own kernel and then persist that kernel. So that's coming out in a few weeks. Dave Foster is working really hard on that. And we're aware that that's going to be a huge barrier for adoption is that, you know, even though our, our um, Python 2 and Python 3 kernels are very mature, they certainly don't have all the packages that everyone's always going to need. So you could go about it this way, but there's going to be a much more sophisticated way and a way to persist that kernel to the research workspace so you don't have to rebuild it every time. Um, yeah, because this, I, I think... You know, there's over 3,000 packages on Conda Forge, so. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, we're we are fully aware that like, if, if we want to go beyond being a novelty, like to be really useful, we have to allow people to customize their environments and also persist those and potentially share them with people, just like data, being like, hey, I have my, you know, my, uh, my Python kernel that has all these packages that I use, so you can have, you can replicate that or you can have a copy of that. That's going to become like, a, First order citizen is these custom custom environments, mm -hmm. and so this right here uh, basically is is retrofitting our Python kernel to run Dask. Like the, the Python kernel that we have right now doesn't have the Dask Conda Forge um, dependencies, and so that's what this is installing. And then basically uh, here's a Here's a dashboard that shows you like the state of the cluster. Let's uh, close this out a little bit. So uh, just to give you an idea of what's going on here. So we we were looking to calculate monthly uh, monthly averages from the SIMHAR model, which is like a huge 15 terabyte, 30 year, uh, six hour time step uh, wind model. And basically trying to connect over um, OpenDAP we would be able to do this analysis in about 12 hours. By running it locally, and instead of connecting over OpenDAP, but accessing the files locally, we reduce that down to about 50 minutes. But 50 minutes is still a lot of time. And so uh, we spun up this test DASK cluster that has 24 cores, I mean, excuse me, 96 cores, and we've been able to reduce the time it takes to process this down from 50 minutes to four minutes. And Dask, and Dask just handles all that stuff for you, right? Yeah, so basically like you create, um, you create like a, a Dask distributed numpy array or Dask distributed, uh, um, one of those other uh, like data, Shoot. Um, can you, can you say, yeah. Can you control plus there? Yeah, thanks. So what's happening right now is this first block of code is actually analyzing it via a single core. And we're only analyzing 1 30th of the entire data set. And it took almost a minute. But down here, we're actually starting to use Dask now. And Dask is going over the entire data set and processing. So we're building these climatologies on the fly. And basically in about it's almost finished. It just finished. So something that was before taking us 12 hours to do over OpenDAP and then one hour to do using a single core 
by parallelizing it over Dask, we've gotten it down to about three minutes. Um, and we've analyzed about 15 terabytes of data. So that's, that's pretty awesome. We're pretty happy with that. And what I think is going to happen is we're going to start to enable scientists to do big data analyses and do it in a way in which um, they can reproduce those things and actually get their hands doing some high performance computing. Yep, this guy's done. These plots should be popping out here someplace. Hopefully. Um, while you're waiting for those, oh, there they go. Okay. There they go. Yep, and it's done. Yeah, that's impressive. And we have, we're starting to create basically. Um, this is so new, this concept, to the research community we work with that we need to actually provide them with examples of how they can write Jupyter Notebooks to do a variety of different things. And so we're coming up with this notebook gallery that allows people to um, visually look at a variety of these different notebooks that we've published out so they can start getting their head wrapped around how they're going to work with this new technology and use it. So that kind of sums up my, my presentation. Um, the one thing I want to stress here is that, you know, this, this system is not fully operational yet. It's not um, uh, fully vetted, but we're extremely happy with what it's able to do at this point. And we're figuring that by February, we're going to be able to open this up for complete public use. Um, the, the idea is to, um, at, at some level, provide free access to core capabilities. So every user will be able to store up to 10 gigabytes of their own local data. They will have at least access to one processing core. They will be able to admit as many DOIs and submit as many packages to data one as possible. There might even be a community Dask cluster, because Dask is multi-tenant meaning you can run multiple jobs in parallel at the same time on the cluster. So we may allocate like a 500 core DAS cluster that anybody using the research workspace has access to and can use whatever they want. But if you have real custom needs, like huge data storage needs, or like uh, big high performance computing needs, um, that might be something that you would have to pay for. But um, on, on the first, like uh, on, on, on the base, the base kind of system, um, it's going to be free and publicly available. Okay, I'm uh, ready for questions. Yeah. So, Rob, you said right now in your in your unpublic. Uh, uh, period, you have 700 users. Uh, that seems like you know that that number's a couple orders of magnitude bigger than what I thought you were going to say. So what what is your when you, when you're talking about being open to the public? Do you guys have a target number of users that you're thinking about? Everybody in the world. <laughs> I um I mean so everybody everybody with a Facebook account or what? Right. Uh, Anybody who would be interested in using this platform for numerical science, um, when, when I talk about the 700 existing users, so those are those are users that are associated with uh, integrated ecosystem research programs that we support. So, for instance, like the National Science Foundation, um, we support their North Gulf of Alaska long-term ecological research site. They use the research workspace to meet their LTER data management requirements. Um, we support the North Pacific Research Board. Um, they fund us. We, we support the Mares Integrated Ecosystem Research Program. So basically, we, 
we are axiom um, is under contract to support these organizations and these larger groups with data management services but we use the research workspace to facilitate that so if you're associated with any of these programs that we're associated with it's very easy to make you uh, a, a user of the of the platform but for somebody who's outside of the research workspace and outside of these existing programs the onboarding process for you is not very straightforward meaning like you would come to the research workspace and it would be completely blank for you so we need to figure out like when you come tabula rosa from the outside we need to have some way to onboard you to familiarize yourself with hey how do i configure my projects what are research campaigns what can i do here right now the users like they're forced to use the research workspace because they're funded by these organizations. So it doesn't matter if the onboarding process isn't as smooth for them. It doesn't matter if they run into bugs, they still have to use it. We've got to really dial in, dial in the interface of the user experience before we open it up for just, I don't want to call them randos, but just people out coming who are interested. We don't want them to get frustrated or confused. We want them to show up and be like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. I, I know how to, I should be creating projects because my projects or my organizations. And, so these types of things. So, yeah, it sounds that it sounds like uh, with 700 users, um, we already have a very, very large user base. But I, I'm expecting that there's probably thousands of numerical scientists or tens of thousands of numerical scientists who could find usefulness in using a platform like this. So, so Rob, um, you, you know, so you're basically setting up something kind of like, in a way, like uh, you know, Google. Earth Engine or something like that. And one of the things that I think people find a little bit, that makes people a little bit nervous about using something like that is what if Google just decides, okay, it's free, but what if Google decides to pull the plug and, you know, we'd rather use something that we're actually paying for that we know is going to go into the upkeep and maintenance of the thing that we depend on, right? So that it has right. a healthy future. Um, and so your business model here is to make money off this by hoping that people will need extra resources and stuff like that. I mean, it's. Yeah. That, okay. The, the business model is not focused on researchers or users. It's actually focused on organizations. So we're, we don't really want a scientific researcher coming to us and giving us money so they can store more data. What we really want is the national science foundation to say, or the, you know, Mbari or the, the North Pacific Research Board, this research entity is like, hey, we're struggling uh, keeping tabs on our research enterprise. Like we have no idea where all of these research products are or the primary data. Like, so what we're hoping is that, and we're finding that this is true, is that organizations, what they do is they say, well, we need a total of five terabytes of total space. Uh, we wanna be able to track all of our research projects and programs here. Um, we'll give you, $20,000 a year to make sure that um, all of that, you know, we have the capacity to store all the data across all of our projects. And then if you are a researcher and you're funded by NPRB, your, your quote is not affected by any data that you upload to that campaign or to that organization that owns that space per se. And so that, that model seems to be working really well is that instead of asking individual researchers to pay for resources, it's more like working with the higher level research organization and saying, hey, this can streamline so many things in your workflow, provide extra, provide enhanced services to your PIs and provide you with a transparent and secure view of like all of your research assets. And so that, that's what the funding model is really gonna be focused on is targeting more organizations who don't have information management capabilities. You know, there are a lot of these NGOs out there who are really struggling when they get federal funds. Like how do they meet these data management requirements? They don't have data managers. They don't have the ability to admit DOIs. They don't have archive centers that are accessible to them. And that's what we're finding is a lot of people are contacting us where they're like, hey, you know, I, I work on this NSF LTER site. We're covered, all the data is covered and we have if, uh, information managers for that, but I work on these other projects and these other research campaigns that don't have this support. And so they're looking for the research workspace to actually fill that void. But that's where I think Great. it does. Right. 
Okay, um, we have four minutes left. Is, is somebody uh, other than you know Ted and myself who've been hogging the uh, microphone want to ask a question? Hey, Aaron, come here. I need you to ask a question. <laughs> okay, Ted, ask another question. <laughs> um, I, uh, it's really an interesting talk, Rob. Uh, you know, there are there are quite a few other um, players in this in this field. You know, a couple that I think about from NSF are like uh, Blue Waters or um, Exceed or uh, what's it called, Jetstream. Um, or in NASA world, there's things like Above or things like Nexus. Are you uh, are you interacting with any of those guys? Um, yeah. So like Nexus is that big HDF distributed data store for like, correct? Well, Nexus is, there's a couple different Nexuses around. There's the one I'm thinking of is at, at Ames. Okay. There might be a different Nexus. I'm thinking of the one at JPL. Yeah, right. They, they, they have two, uh, they have yet to agree on who actually owns that name. <laughs> but so there's like a compute, near the data storage solution called Nexus at Ames? Yeah. Do they have the other tools like the metadata editor and like those types of components or is it more of just compute? Uh, I think it's, I, I'm not completely sure. I, I think it's mostly uh, compute. But it might be an interesting set of people to, you know, partner with and, and or understand what they're doing. Absolutely. I mean, one interesting thing here, I think, um, this is basically like private cloud, right? But one one difference between this and the public clouds is that you have infi well, you have InfiniBand right here, and you are also not sort of uh, forcing people to say move to some kind of different storage technology, say through like S3 or whatever. You right. can they can they can just keep their files, right? Oh yeah, that's exactly the idea. Is that I mean. 90, 98% of the data that has been uploaded here will not see the light of day. So there's only like the final gold nugget, nugget data packages that actually get exposed. And so, you know, if down the road, five years from now, if you have somebody who's doing this grand numerical synthesis, they can actually come in and find, you know, what were the field reports and the cruise reports and the, the, the initial primary level data, you know, um, get all the context for the project. And that's what the research organizations are super interested in too, is they, they want to actually see not just the final published data set, but they want to see all of those preliminary products, you know. Right. Hey, there's one last question here that I think is a good one. Um, is this software something that you know some say another commercial you know organization could install on their end or something or is the software you know is this whole environment kind of a um you know your intellectual property or we i mean you it's based on open source software but it it's not um it's not designed to be it's it's designed explicitly to be monolithic because it enables as soon as you start separating these things, then you don't have this community connectedness. The idea here is that if you're a member of the research workspace, you can share your project with anybody else who's a member of the research workspace. As soon as you start standing up siloed instances of the research workspace, that interconnectedness is lost. Um, also, like, you know, what makes this really powerful is that it sits on top of this cyber infrastructure stack of all of this data that we've assembled together. So, I mean, you could you could do something like the research workspace using Jupyter Hub, just putting Jupyter Hub on your own independent server. Um, but right now, the research workspace is not the code base is in nowhere near a shape where it could be published as open source. It's high, lots of internal dependencies, hard you know cart code is hard written to deal with our HPC infrastructure. It hasn't been abstracted out for like data stores, those types of things. Um, and we initially were planning on making this thing open source and we submitted several proposals to NSF to do so, but uh, we never received funding. So we had to build it ourselves.
So we we don't really have the time uh, to make this thing pub publish, publish, publishable out as an open source product. Um, maybe we can find some funding to do so. Uh, but does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Well, okay, Rob, thanks so much. That was uh, that's fabulous. I wanna I wanna jump back on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, um, <laughs> so uh, just let you, let you guys know, um, you can't join from the outside the research workspace, but anybody who's a user of the research workspace can add users, create a project, and add external users to it. So if you're really interested in using the research workspace, hit me up or hit Rich Rich up. I think there's some other people on the on the call who have um, access to. But uh, basically, if you're interested in giving it a test drive and writing some Jupyter notebooks, hit one of us up and we'll create a test project for you and get you in there. All right, Rob. Thanks, thanks again. And folks, uh, so next month, again, November 9th, we're going to be hearing about Jupyter Widgets, which is how to build interactive GUIs for your notebooks. So that should be really cool. So anyway, um, so see you next month. And thanks again, Rob. It's awesome. Okay, great. Bye-bye.